Hello, so today I'm joined by a very special guest. Um, who are you? I'm Gemma Bale. I'm a medical physicist from UCL Engineering. So um, I thought we'd do a little bit of an interview. We've actually been making another video today um, looking at how light can be used to actually sense inside the body. Um, and I suspect a lot of people watching this video might be thinking, you know, how, you know, how can they do your kind of job in the future? But first of all, do you want to say what you actually do? I mean, what kind of stuff do you do day to day? What kind of projects are you involved with? So I mostly build machines that are all based on light and these machines are used to monitor the brain. So a lot of people say to me, like, how can you get light into the body? And yeah. the most easy demonstration of that is to shine like your phone torch through your fingers and you'll see that the your fingers will sort of light up bright red. Okay, should we try that? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so yeah, phone torches are really good for this because they're really nice and bright. So yeah. you've got a white phone torch light and then if I put my fingers over it, you can see that the light's coming out red. Yeah, so, uh, and I know you can probably do this at night time as well, can't you? Yeah. To see that really clearly. So yeah, um, I guess you can just try this now, can't you? Get your phone out, you look through your hand, um, but surely doesn't most of your kind of finger, don't your fingers kind of stop most of the light getting through? So they do stop most of the light getting through. So as you know, white light is made up of all the colours of the rainbow yeah. and your hands will block all of those colours except for red. So that's why you end up with red light coming out of the other side. Okay, but things like the bone kind of get in the way, don't they? So no, actually red light travels really well through the bone. So Okay. Um, so it's quite cool because that means that we can shine through the skull and that means we can get into the brain with just red light. And I suppose compared to other things like x-rays where an x-ray is quite high energy radiation so mm -hmm. that means it can cause lots of damage to people. It's quite, you know, it's it's not invasive, you're not cutting somebody open but actually... It's still causing damage to the tissue. It is, yeah. So light is completely safe, isn't it? Completely safe. So it's the same as if um, like we're, we're already, already surrounded by visible light. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it doesn't cause any damage to the tissue at all. So um, we can actually, I guess we'll maybe talk a bit more about how you can actually scan babies and other people to look at brain activity. Um, we've got over here a pulse oximeter. Mm. So a lot of you might have seen one of these perhaps, or maybe you've got one at school that you've tried in some of your biology lessons. So how does that work then? So pulse oximeter is probably the biggest success of optics or light in the medical world. Okay. So you can see inside the pulse oximeter there's a red flashing light. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Um, and that is uh, shining through my finger, just the same as the torchlight did. And on the other side, there's a detector. And that detector is looking at how much light is traveling through my finger. Mm -hmm. And that will vary depending on how many times my heart is beating. So when there is a big pulse of when your heart beats, there's an increase of blood in the finger. So that means that more light is going to get absorbed. Yeah. So the detector will see that and it will be able to pick up the pattern and work out how many heartbeats you're having per minute. Yeah, so as a heart rate sensor, I guess that's how a lot of them work. I think sometimes you get Fitbits or things that actually shine mm. a light into you and they kind of, I think they use light, do they, to look at your pulse? Yeah, yeah, so the Fitbit is um, slightly different because they actually use green light. Okay. So the light isn't traveling all the way through your wrist or wherever yeah. you're measuring, it's just reflecting straight back. Okay. But that green light is quite sensitive to uh, the changes in haemoglobin. So literally the color of your skin changes every time your heart is beating. Yeah. We just can't see it's it. Always, yeah. <laughs> um, and this one here I think what's quite interesting is that it obviously gives you a reading about your pulse rate, then, but it's uh, called a pulse oximeter. So oximeter meaning? Oxygen meter, basically. Okay. So it's also measuring the percentage of oxygen in your arterial blood. Okay. So that should be around 100%, like 98, 99%. Yeah. Um, so your artery should be mostly saturated with oxygen. Mm -hmm. The way it does this is instead of shining just one light through, it's shining actually two colours. One is the red yeah. and one is the infrared so that's invisible but yeah. um, we use it a lot changing the channel on our tv mm -hmm. um, but by shining two colors into the body it can start to look at how the different colors are absorbed yeah and we can relate that to what's inside the body and the mo biggest absorber in the red and infrared range is blood the hemoglobin yeah and because the hemoglobin changes color based on how much oxygen there is yeah we can then use our two different colours to look at two different kinds of haemoglobin, oxygenated and deoxygenated haemoglobin, yeah. and then work out how much of each of them are there. So we've got basically two things in the blood, and then we've got two different sensors. So we've exactly. got red and, and infrared. Infrared, yeah. Perfect. So yeah, so these ones here, um, you might have probably had a go with one. And I think, again, this is something that um, I think a few years ago, I, my appendix burst and I was in hospital, and they, they do all sorts of tests. And this is the kind of thing that they can just put on you and just that kind of monitoring thing that, um, you know, is, is relatively cheap as well. So yeah. 
Yeah, so it'll be on most intensive care units. Um, monitoring is a very cheap thing to do, and yeah. it just makes sure that the um, patient is receiving enough oxygen, which is obviously really important Perfect. for health. Good. And so, I mean, I guess you're not researching this. This is just an example of the kind of stuff that um, some of the kind of technology you're involved with. But yes. what do you actually do day to day? What are you actually looking at at the moment, for example? You mentioned about babies or something and yes. looking inside their heads. So <laughs> the, one of the problems that we were presented with, yeah. so we're medical physicists, and so we were speaking with doctors and they have a problem with um, in intensive care units yeah. it's very difficult to monitor the brain okay. so the best way of monitoring the brain really is with like an MRI scanner but mm -hmm. obviously you can't have one of those at every single patient's bed and they're quite expensive care. aren't they and incredibly quite, expensive quite scary for the people actually going yeah. into this kind of massive tunnel there's yeah. like sounds of magnets and things. exactly yeah. so we're trying to look for an alternative way that we can monitor what's going on in the patient's brain without yeah. having to put them in an MRI scanner. Yeah. Um, so what we're doing is um, we're using this technology and essentially doing the same thing we're doing on our fingers with a pulse oximeter, but on the brain um, using what we call near-infrared spectroscopy. So is that visible or is it infrared then? Kind so of it's, um, it expands slightly... the wavelength range from 600 to 1,000 nanometers, okay. which goes from this sort of top end of red into the yeah. what we call near-infrared. Okay, and so you basically have this kind of bright light, what you just... Put it on somebody's head? Yeah, so we um, shine light. So normally we use optical fibres. So we yeah. have like a machine in one place and we carry the light using optical fibres. So yeah. these can be like metres long. So mm -hmm. you don't have to have the patient crowded with machinery. Yeah. Uh, the optical fibres carry light to the brain. Mm -hmm. And then we'll shine the light in at one position and we'll detect it back out a few centimetres away. Okay. And that light that we detect back out will have gone through the skull into the brain and um, interacted with the blood in the brain. So what comes back out, we can work out um, the colour inside the brain and therefore how much oxygen is in the brain. Okay, so I guess in principle it sounds fairly straightforward. I guess in the realities of actually trying to work out I suppose what's actually happening in the brain as well, because that's really complicated. I don't, do we yeah. understand that yet, do we? The brain? No, is so yeah, the brain is really complex. And that's yeah. kind of what's so great about medical physics is that sometimes, some days I'm in the lab, you yeah. know, working on optics. Like, obviously we don't get a huge amount of light in out of the head. If mm -hmm. I shine light in here, the, the amount of photons that get all the way through are very, very small. So yeah. part of my job is working out how can I best capture all that light. Mm -hmm. But then also part of my job is, okay, we've now collected these this uh, physiological data on patients, how does that link to um, what's going on in the brain? And that's, yeah, really fascinating cool. and interesting. And so you're a medical physicist uh, and you work in the engineering department at university at uh, UCL? Yes. So um, what did you do? So I guess going back again, so I guess a lot of people watching this are probably either GCSE students or doing their A-levels. Um, how did you get to where you are? So going back, can you remember which A levels you did? Yeah, yeah. So I, I really always loved maths and like puzzles when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and so at A level, yeah. I chose maths and further maths, yeah. um, physics and chemistry. And then I also chose biology. Um, okay, so <laughs> yeah. two, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Um, but I chose biology because at the time I wanted to be a dentist, weirdly. Okay. Um, yeah. I think I wanted to have something to do with the medical world and okay. dentistry... I, I don't know. Yeah, um, it's like being a doctor, but a bit easier. Yeah. <laughs> All the dentists who are watching this will disagree My with that. My brother-in-law is a dentist. Okay, He's not going to be pleased with that. You won't have to be very rude. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. um, okay so, so you did like sort of the kind of five, so maths, further maths, physics, maths and... Uh, physics, physics chemistry, and chemistry. Yes. Okay, but you didn't do five to the end? No, so a after doing like my AS level in biology, yeah. I, I dropped that. I wasn't super keen on the biology. I wanted to do more... Um, maths and physics really yeah. um, and then when I went to I remember going around lots of different universities when yeah. I was applying and I was looking at like should I do maths should I do physics and then I ca occasionally came across engineering but okay I didn't know anything about engineering. I had no idea that medical engineering or medical physics was a thing. But you didn't necessarily want to be working in hospitals doing biological stuff. No, I had no, I, no, I had no idea. So I, okay. I just knew I liked maths and wanted to do something that was like applied. Yeah. So I ended up doing physics. I really wish now that I'd known that engineering was more varied than what I sort of had yeah. an idea of. I had an idea it was just men wearing hard hats on a building site. Okay. Um. So I ended up doing physics. Yeah. And during my physics degree, I came across um, sort of microscopy. Okay. So that's a form of um, using light or an optics yeah. um, to look at biological things. So that was kind of... Yeah, and I think probably on a physics degree, there's a bit more stuff looking at light and how that can be used. And mm. there's, it's a whole kind of subcategory of physics, isn't it, that people specialise in. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. optics is like, yeah, quite a big part. Well, in my mind, it's a yeah. very big part of the physics 
curriculum. But, um, okay. Yeah, so but using optics and lights to look at something biological kind of caught my attention. I was like, ah, oh, this is where I can actually feel like I'm making a difference and impact, you know, healthcare. Okay. Yeah, so was that a three-year course that you did? Yeah, so I did three years at Imperial College. So I did okay. my BSc in physics. Yeah. And after that, I was really unsure what I wanted to do. But I'd done this project in optics for microscopy. Yeah. And I found this course where you did a year of masters in optics, mm -hmm. and that, and then after that you would do a PhD. So in my okay. mind, I was thinking I'll do this masters in optics, yeah. And they were, it was like a paid position, so I was like, well, I'll get a free masters. <laughs> so, so you, and I guess you know you get paid not a kind of a crazy amount of money, but no, it helps no. you live, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's it's, it's called a you? stipend. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So they, yeah, it's um, yeah, a pay. I guess yeah, you can live on a. And, yeah. and also get a master's yeah. and in that year I did this master's at UCL University College London yeah. and it was also combined with the University of Cambridge and that was a great year because I got to explore lots of different optics projects mm -hmm. across both universities and I found this thing near infrared spectroscopy which is what I'm doing now yeah. um, applying lights to measure um, the brain and that's something I suppose you didn't know about when you were doing A-levels you didn't think I'm no. going to do these A-levels because I want to do this it's no. just I guess A-levels got you the next step. Yeah, so I think I I was thinking about this the other day. Like, I think the reason that I've got to somewhere where I really enjoy what I do without yeah. knowing where I was going is I've always tried to do the thing I enjoyed most. So when I was think when I was doing the biology, I didn't really enjoy it that much. Yeah. So that's why I focused more on the mathematical side. Yeah. So I think if you always follow the thing you enjoy most, even if it's not the thing that you're best at, yeah. then you'll get somewhere where you enjoy. I guess you're going to be more enthusiastic and you want yeah. to do it. Okay. Yeah. So after your master's, you did a PhD? Yes. So I did my PhD um, in this field. So I, for my PhD, I mm. built a machine. And that machine is now in a intensive care unit for babies. That's really good. It's yeah, it's, yeah. it's really amazing to have built something that's now being used as a, as a research tool. Yeah. Um, and we're monitoring babies who are in intensive care and seeing if our signals that we pick up with light, mm -hmm. seeing whether they can tell us something about how well the baby's doing and whether maybe in the future we'd be able to say to doctors, okay, this is how the baby's doing. You might need to like redirect your care plan. Okay. And so I suppose you've got to have a good understanding about what doctors are doing and the kind of other technicians yeah, in hospitals. Yeah. So, so it's, it's not just about, I guess, the, the pure physics about here's a machine. All. It's like, how do people use it? And actually, I guess, the data analysis and things. So, yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah. So you have to think about, yeah, so there's the optics sides, but a lot of that is done in a in an optics lab, which is like essentially a black room with lots yeah. of mirrors and lenses. Yeah. So how do you take that? into a hospital which mm -hmm. is a crazy environment and really busy and you don't want to be impacting doctors and nurses care yeah. you know um normal jobs so yeah yeah taking that and getting it into the hospital and where it's not invasive where it actually works mm -hmm. um was that was probably the biggest challenge um and then once you've measured um patients how do you treat that data so my job is horrend like ridiculously varied. Yeah, like, you say um, horrendously varied. Horrendously <laughs> varied. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. So, so I think medical physics. Um, maybe an advice for people. Maybe they they are interested in medicine. They don't want to be a doctor necessarily. But how can they sort of still work in the kind of health, I guess, sector? How can they can maybe combine that with what they're doing mm. at a level? So, any advice for that or just? So there's lots of different courses. I mean, so I did a pure physics degree, and yeah. on those degrees, you do get to exposed to lots of different areas of physics. So. Yeah you are able to sort of specialise later and maybe do a master's in medical physics. Mm -hmm. But then there are lots of, um, if you're really sure you want to do medical physics or biomedical engineering, yeah. uh, there's lots of programmes where you can do that straight away. So at UCL we have um, a few different courses. One is, um, med is physics with medical physics. So okay. that's mostly a physics degree where you do some additional medical physics uh, modules and projects and things. Yeah. And then we also have a biomedical engineering course. Okay. So yeah, there's sort of different... Uh, approaches. Very good and I think like a lot of if, if you're interested in this I mean um, you know all the websites have lots of information so if you if you're thinking about UCL then if you go to the UCL website I mean by the way if you're going to go to UCL you should be able to kind of get to their website and find out what, <laughs> yeah. what you want to do but whatever thing you're, you're thinking about um, all the universities are really trying to sell themselves and they'll make it very clear about which subjects you have to do at A level what kind of grades you should be aiming for to actually get onto that course. Um, but I think it's not always just a simple, don't just go for straight physics, don't just do mechanical engineering. There's a lot of choice out there. And even if that's what you do to begin with, I guess yeah. you can 
kind of can make your career as you kind of go to masters or PhDs even yeah you can really choose what you want then so it doesn't set in stone that just because you did a physics degree you have to be a physics teacher or a physicist yes so, yeah. yeah and another thing is that engineering like one thing I've discovered is that engineering is not just maths and physics it's yeah. incredibly creative like I literally create yeah. um, either things like physic physical machines or I create algorithms to process my data it's very creative it's yeah. very um, you have to be a really good communicator because you're always working with people who have expertise that you don't so I have to work with um, a lot of doctors and have to be able to communicate yeah. physics to them and they have to be able to communicate medicine to me so it's, it's really um, interactive and creative yeah and you're not just sat on your own working through mass problems no. you've got to work no. in a team science you've got to is to... very much a team it team is sport. I think you've got to be imaginative and I think there's lots of great design that happens and I think that's often maybe underrated or maybe people don't kind of realise how important yeah, it is definitely. okay so if you want to find out a bit more about medical physics um, I guess I've got some videos that I've made on A-level physics online that cover a lot of the things you need to know for medical physics for A-level uh, you've got a podcast that you're involved with now? Yeah, so we've just launched UCL Medical Physics Podcast, so you can find that. Um, also, um, my, our research group, Metabolite, have a website, and we've got some videos and some resources on there, so you can check those out too. Very good. Um, thank you for coming in to talk thank about this. Thank you for this. having me. Brilliant. Thank you.